This is going to be a little bit of a review for this group because we've done the, the RGB Color Lab and PCM1, so we'll review some of the color stuff. We'll talk about uh, color in, in a forensic aspect too. So let's jump in. So we're going to be talking about perceived color, like uh, what is puce? <laughs> That's actually a color name. I have no idea what it is. Um, uh, we'll talk about quantitative color, so the CIE tristimulus values, which is a review. But we'll, I think still, just judging from past uh, experience on exams and homeworks, that it, it helps to have a bit of review on that. Then the standard RGB values and so on. And then we'll talk about using color in a forensic uh, system and then the different colorants, inks, toners, paints. So our, our perception of color is a learned behavior. We learn our colors early and you have all these little toys for kids that, that teach all the different color names. And of course, we, uh, you know, we have like ROY, GBIV, or ROY GBIV, you know, those are the basic ones. And then we get into the crazy stuff like mauve and, and chartreuse and dusty rose, whatever that is, you know. And, and so it's just, there's never an end to the names that we can give colors. You go to the paint store and see all of the wall of colors and all of the different sea foam and it's just it's just crazy that's what drives me crazy about it is because i like to have numbers associated with it and so every one of those little paint swatches would have a different uh numerical quantitative color associated with it i wanted i mean i didn't actually want it but i was thinking when we had kids i was like you know this is a learned behavior. There's nothing about the color red that you look and then you're just associated with that word, right? That's a taught behavior. And I thought, what if we swapped it, like taught our kids that red was blue and blue was red, you know? And I thought, no, that's probably a bad idea. <laughs> Plus it, it's, you know, they're gonna hear it from other places and then they'll be like, dad lied to me. <laughs> so that's probably a bad idea too. Um, Thomas was showing, uh, uh, you know, we couldn't decide, is he right-handed, left-handed, right-handed, left-handed? Then so I would I would take the pens or pencils or crayons and put them in his other hand and then he would put it back. And I was like, okay, he's definitely left-handed, you know, just to see if he really had a preference. And then, but as far as like kicking a ball or throwing or whatever, he's he, he really hasn't. I don't know if I caused that by switching his hands all the time or if uh, he really is equally, you know, talented with both hands, I don't know, but strange. But anyway, colors is again, early learned behavior, uh, exceptions, weddings, kitchen paint, etc. We I said the system is artificial, but agreed upon. <laughs> There's some exceptions, perhaps. <laughs> then we have uh, efforts to try to quantify or I wouldn't say quantify, but uh, standardize color. And one of the earliest ones was the Pantone color chips and color cards. So this uh, company in 1962 is a manufacturer of color cards for cosmetic applications. Uh, and then other people knew about these Pantone color chips and they would buy um, these booklets that were you know, really thick, like a binder this big, and it had in it polymers or plastic samples that were colored based on all of these. So you could set them up next to whatever formulation you were making or, or what have you so that you could get photographs comparing to the different Pantone color chips. And so it was a standardized system that people could use. And so you'll hear occasionally the uh, Pantone color number, like this one says 203M. So that's that's the, you know, this color right here. And you know, again, it's, it's just another standard color system, but it's not very quantitative. I mean, there's numbers associated with it, but you can't really tell, um, you know, how to make that color. Whereas if you had uh, the RGB values or some sort of paint mixing pigment, uh, formula, then you could you could make that color. So uh, we've quantified the color, the CIE system, CIE stands for Commission Internationale de l'Eclairage, which is French for the International Commission on Color from 1931. So even before the Pantone color chips. So it standardized all three parts. So this is the main point here to think about that, that for correct color perception, you need to focus on all three parts. You need a standard illumination or you need to um, uh, control the illumination. You need a standard observer. And so if you want someone to describe a color, you need to know that they're not colorblind, right? <laughs> so, that makes, so how would you know if you're colorblind? They have those little colorblindness tests with the little colored dots. And 
they'll for um, for someone who's not colorblind, they can see a particular number in those little dotted pictures. And then uh, for someone who is colorblind, uh, the contrast is is not detectable because they're missing a pigment. Okay, and maybe I should go and Google and get one of those. Um, it's really funny uh, in in Russia. So my, in graduate school, I had a good friend who went to Moscow University, Moscow State, and then he came over here for graduate school. And I had taken Russian for uh, my undergraduate language, and so um, we became quick friends. I was trying to always test out my Russian on him. And uh, he said, oh, your pr pronunciation is awful, you know. And so we work on my pronunciation. Um, but he said you couldn't be a chemist if you were colorblind. Like they had they had rules, you know. I mean, here we're doing all kinds of things with accommodations and making sure that, you know, everybody, if they want that to be their dream, they can, you know, we'll try to make it happen. Okay, but not in Russia. They're like, no, <laughs> colorblind, you're out, you know. And they did the little testing for colorblindness in groups of three. So he goes in and uh, um, he sees the little color thing and they say, what number do you see? And he says, like 57, you know, and then the next one says 43. And he's like, oh, dang, you know, and then the third one said 43. And he goes, ah, I'm colorblind and I don't know it, you know, because what are the odds that the other two would be colorblind, not him? He found out later he wasn't colorblind. Mm -hmm. So the second one may have been colorblind and the third one's in a bind. Right. Because you think, what are the odds of two people being colorblind? But that's probably not what happened. The third one saying, oh, heck, <laughs> I see 57. But the other one guy said 43. What do I choose? You know, and maybe he chose the other one thinking he might have been colorblind. Anyway, it's a psychological experiment at that point, not whether you're testing colorblindness or not. So but anyway, Michael thought that, that the other two were colorblind and that he wasn't. And he was thinking about the statistics of that. So standard observer is actually a thing, right? You've got to have all three pigments in your retina that can see color. Now, your retina has different regions to it. The middle is the, is the best for color, um, uh, color perception. And so they limit the angle at which you're looking at the colors and if you're going to evaluate it. And they have a two degree observer uh, angle uh, from, from the center of your retina. And then you have to have a standard sample and observation geometry. So they've done this uh, experiment um, it can deliver numerical data, and so we have the standard source profiles, the standard pigment functions, and the standard color spaces. So here is uh, here are the different illuminants. So illuminant A is uh, this one here is like a black body curve. And gosh, I think it's. It may be like 3000 Kelvin, I'm not sure. But notice it's mostly infrared. So out here is IR. And, and so luminant A is like a tungsten filament. Um, in terms of temperature, at a, at a pretty cool temperature compared to the others. Um, D65 and, and D50, these are shown up here. These are um, this 50 and 65, that's really 5,000 Kelvin and 6,500 Kelvin. So those are meant to try to match the, the profile of light that you would get from a hot filament at 6,500 Kelvin or 5,000 Kelvin. So these are the, again, this is how much light and the and this relative colors of light that are hitting your sample. If you were to use a, a, a filament A or like a luminant A, that would be the situation where you're in a room that's lit by, you know, 60 watt or dim uh, bulbs, incandescent bulbs. If you're in a room like this, these are, are daylight fluorescent bulbs. And so you would use like D65 to accurately represent the color in a, in a room like this. So here are the three uh, things that are um, that are standardized. We have standard illumination. So in this case, we've got red, green, and blue lights. These different filters on a on a on a bright white light. And so we're sending in the blue light, the green light, the red light. Um, we have standard uh, also standard illumination on the on the questioned 
light source. So we might have a light source that we're trying to um, evaluate here. Then we have the standard point of view and the standard observer. So that point of view is that two degree, or they have a 10 degree standard too, but most of the time we use the two degree uh, incident angle on the eye, and then a person that's not colorblind. So how does this work? Well, we take this, uh, this light here and we can replace it with a monochromator to actually map out the pigments in the eye. So if you have this monochromator shining a purple light on here and you have these uh, various um, proportions of red, green, and blue, the observer will have a, like a, I'll just say a knob on each of these that they can turn. And so let's say we put in, we have this, uh, this pigment here that's um, uh, this purple color. They can go through and they can adjust the various amounts of red, green, and blue to give, us, to give them that same amount of color. Doing this at every wavelength. So if we use this monochromator to pick like a wavelength of uh, say 400 or 405 nanometers, then they would adjust these three different pots and the green would be turned all the way down because if you add green at 405, you're gonna change the color and it's not gonna match. And so then you turn the green all the way down and it's a little closer. You turn the blue all the way up because it's very blue, but it still doesn't quite match. And so you have to add just a tiny bit of red light to it. And then you do this at 410 and 420 and 430 and so on. You move your way through the whole spectrum and what you're actually doing by matching the monochromator light to the three pots on the different images, you're actually mapping out the spectrum of the pigments in your eye. It's kind of bizarre. You, the observer is actually um, using this comparison to map out the absorption spectrum of the pigments in the eye. That's really interesting to me because there's no, um, like they didn't extract the pigments from someone's eye and then do the experiment. They actually let the eye be the detector and there's a pigment in front of the detector. And so the person's using their brain to compare these two things and is actually mapping out the responses of their detector. So it's pretty fascinating. So these are the standard observer functions. So here they are kind of uh, mapped onto the colors in a, in a visible spectrum. And you can see that the, um, the X one here, it's kind of a pink color, that's giving you mostly the response in the red region. And so that one's the, the red pigment. The Y is the green pigment. And then Z is the blue. And then this axis over here, this relative spectral power is the uh, D65, the 6500 Kelvin illuminant. And you can see that it's got a little bit more blue light coming out than the red. And so this, uh, this particular light bulb is gonna, gonna appear to be more blue. If he had a, a tungsten uh, light bulb next to it, an incandescent light bulb, it would definitely appear more yellow or red than the D65. Uh, here's just some uh, reflectance spectra of crepe paper. You guys probably know from the party store or whatever, you've seen crepe paper before. Here's all the different colors. And so you can see that um, the blue paper, here we have again reflectance in the blue region, very little in the red. So, I, you know, you can use this particular slide to kind of determine what color something is going to be based on its transmission or reflectance spectra. So here's uh, this yellow paper. Notice how it's no blue and you get a, a, a bunch of yellow and a bunch of red. So yellow actually has yellow and red and orange being transmitted and we perceive that as yellow. Uh, the green paper here, it kind of matches that green color pigment in our eye. So we see, and it's not very bright. I mean, it doesn't take much in the green for us to perceive green. And, and so our eye is incredibly sensitive to green. Just a small change in the green spectrum our eye can really detect. Um, here's the orange paper. Notice it looks like the yellow, only it's just red shifted a little bit. So here we get the orange and the red spectrum and that, that's perceived as orange. 
so that's I think um, I think that's something that is worth noting. Okay, so here's the yellow. Notice where it cuts across the spectrum. It cuts off, cuts across at about um, 550. And then the orange cuts across at around 600. Red would, would cut across just a little bit further than that. So notice my red pen just disappears when I get into the red spectrum. Let me go ahead and change. So it's coming across, you know, 625, 6, uh, you know, probably 625. So red, orange, yellow, all look like that. They all have just uh, nothing in the blue and then this jump up where they're transmitting or reflecting the red, the orange, or the yellow. Um, notice brown. Brown is just red, but not, not very much is reflected. So a lot of absorption. Uh, mostly, most light is absorbed. Very little is transmitted. And so the only thing that makes a difference between, say, black and brown is just this little bit of red light that gets through. So you take a black sample and it reflects a little bit of red, that's going to be seen as brown. If it reflects all of the light, in equal amounts, but just a small, you would see it as gray. <clears throat> so hopefully if you see a filter spectrum or, um, you know, a reflective spectrum of, of an object, you can look at it and you can kind of intuit, okay, that looks like it might be a green substance, that might be a yellow substance, that might be blue. Now color is observed, not absorbed. So if you're on this side of the sample over here, you're looking at the light that's transmitted or maybe even scattered. So we would see this blue solution, white lights going in, which has all the wavelengths of light and then blue light is, is transmitted. And so here are your equations. It's the amount of light that can, comes through over, over the amount of light hitting the sample. So that's transmittance. Um, that's e to the minus absorbance. Then you have reflectance. You have a couple of different ways of reflecting light. This is diffuse reflectance. So all of the light hits the sample. And then we have what's called an integrating sphere. So this sphere integrates the light that's bouncing off of the sample at all angles except the specular angle. And so typically we look 90 degrees. So the detector is down here 90 degrees to the light that's hitting so that we don't see any of the light coming from the source and we don't get any specular reflectance from our sample. So it's only the diffuse angles. And we would always check this with a, with a white standard and a black standard. So we want to scale the like total reflective area and then the totally absorbing area. So that sets our max and our min. So here's our minimum. The black signal goes here. We subtract that from our sample. We subtract that from the, uh, the signal coming from the white sample. And so that sets our baseline. This sets the full range of values. So our detector is going to have two responses. It's going to have a response for black and a response for white. We want that to be sort of zero and one. So we put that in the denominator, that difference. And then all of this is at each wavelength. So we have the response at each wavelength. And then specular reflectance is angle preserving. So we have the normal to the sample here. And so this incident angle is equal to the observed angle. So notice that's a particular angle of reflectance and it's called specular reflectance. And so the, this diffuse reflectance can be added to the specular reflectance to get the total reflectance. And then roughness, 
let's see, how do I want to do this? If it's equal to So if it's a really smooth sample, like the surface is just like a mirror, even if it's colored, most of your light's gonna be specularly reflected because it's got a smooth surface. If it's a rough surface, then a lot of your um, light is gonna go in diffuse angles and you'll see um, a higher amount or proportion of diffuse reflectance. So that would give you an idea of the rough surface. Now we can do this with an ocean optics visual, visible spectrometer. It's what we used in, in the PCHEM lab. It's a fiber optic spectrometer. It's field portable. You can hook this thing up to, to a battery and you could take it to the scene. You could actually measure the reflectance spectrum of evidence on, in the field. Don't sure if they'd use that or not, but it's definitely something that could be used. Here's an example for a paint analysis setup. And so you can, again, you've got the, um, We've got the source here, We've got this, the uh, detector, monochromator. Sample geometry, and so here's the fiber optic coming in. So you have your white and black standards here. <clears throat> and then this right here is an attenuator. Um, I would say light adjustment, how about that? It just helps you adjust the range and so that your detector is able to detect the, the differences. Okay, so basic color analysis, a uh, simple color wheel would show that if you have a yellow absorption, so something that's yellow, then it's gonna result in a violet or, or blue reflectance or transmittance. But the problem is what if there are two absorbance peaks or more? So really this is, uh, even though this is sort of, the, I call it the freshman color analysis, um, it's talked about, it only really works if you have one peak, okay? If there are two peaks or a complex spectrum, you really can't use it. This is the better color analysis. So this is the spectrum of permanganate. Okay. And you know that solution to be a purple solution. Okay, so this is our purple solution. We can take that, run it through the uh, visible spectrometer, and that's what we get. We can take that spectrum and run it through this colorimetric analysis where we determine the tri-stimulus values. It's X, Y, and Z. Now these are capital X, Y, and Z. They're, it is case sensitive. The lowercase X and Y are the chromaticity coordinates. So, um, and then we can transform that X, Y, Z to RGB values, and then we can convert those RGB values to 8-bit values, and then we can display them. And so this is where these values came from, 186, 0, 168. And so you can see that, you know, if this was maxed out, it'd be 255 on both, but it's still pretty high. It's a high on the red, R, G, and B, and high in the blue. So you see this is the blue region, this is the red region, and this is the green region. So notice there's very little in the green. We see some red, we see some blue. And then we can compare that to the photograph. And so this is an actual photograph of that solution. And here is what the color analysis gave. So pretty good match. You could also add in computational chemistry. If anybody's interested in doing that, just for grins, there's a couple of videos where I talked through this in the PCHEM uh, YouTube channel. Uh, look for the uh, 5382 videos. Those that are the graduate course where I walk them through the computational chemistry piece. We never added that into PCHEM 1. It just got too in depth. And so 
Uh, for the graduate course, though, that's what, what I do is I teach them how to then add in computational chemistry to model the RGB values of a compound from Gaussian. So we can take this, um, uh, these color matching functions and we can sort of treat them like the three primary colors. Any spectrum can be fitted with those functions to determine how much of each color makes up the color of the unknown spectrum. Oh, uh, it's, it's, those are the pigment functions in our eyes. So what we're really doing is how much of the pigment, the R pigment's gonna be tickled by this light and how much of the G and how much of the B uh, pigments are gonna be, you know, uh, uh, stimulated by, by this particular light. And that gives us the X, Y, and Z values. That similar fitting is used by paint salesmen at the, at the hardware store to match a paint, only they have way more pigments than just three. So they have this huge carousel that has all of the different dyes that they can add to the base paint color. And they'll take your paint sample and stick it on that spectrometer and it's using exactly like this ocean optic spectrometer. And instead of using uh, the X, Y, and Z tristimulus functions, it will match all of their pigments and it'll find the best recipe. So it'll just do an R squared value. If I add, you know, uh, two ounces of this color and five ounces of that color into this base color of paint, um, that's the best recipe based on this R squared value. So they know the, the, the pigment spectra of each of those at various dilutions. And so then this computer can calculate the best recipe. Um, that's called chemometrics and it's, it's pretty straightforward. And, and you can see too that, uh, I don't know if you've been impressed, I've gotten paint matched and I thought this is a really weird color. And then they put the little dab on top after mixing it and they dry it off. And I mean, it is a great match. It's pretty impressive. So this is how that ASTM works. We're taking this, uh, this, these three functions here, plus the observer function, this D65 illuminate and our, our visible spectrum. So remember this was the uh, permanganate spectrum and that's the, this spectrum is the R lambda spectrum. Okay, and then we have this illuminant here, this S, that's the source of light, and it goes there. It also goes here. And then we scale everything by this source times the green spectrum. That's just the way the standard is written. Okay, it gives us good results. So in all three of these denominators, we have the same sort of normalization function of the source times the green. And then what makes this the X value here, the X value is the X function or the red function. So notice the capital X is really the red. So it's, it's like RGB, only it's X, Y, Z. It's just a different scale, a different number, but this is gonna give us that X value and that's red. Now, whenever we have this sort of sum of all of these, this is some products, right? We take the full spectrum and we're, we're multiplying every number. So we're taking this number here times that number times that number. And that happens to be a big value, doesn't it? See that? And so that's the numerator. So we have a big number in the numerator. And then we divide by just the, the white number times the green number. Okay, and so that's our that's our standard um, standardization. But the numerator is big because I have, uh, I have a little bit of red here, the, the, um, the um, white uh, illumination in here. But if I get to this point right here in the spectrum, I have a big number for the illumination, a big number for the red, and I have a big number in my response spectrum. And so I've got a, another large number here. So when I'm adding up all of these num large numbers, when R and X both have big numbers, then I get a big X value. So what we're really testing is the overlap, the overlap of the pigment function with the response function. And you can see that this, this area under this curve matches this red area quite a bit. And so that means I have a lot of red in this sample and it even hits over here. So there's some overlap over here too. So I have a big X value for this particular um, sample spectrum. The green, okay, whenever I have a, a big illumination number here and a big green number here in my sample spectrum, I have almost zero. 
And so there's very not very much green overlap. And so for my green number, that's for my sample, all of this zeros here, right here, are gonna cancel out the source and the green pigment. So I'm gonna have a low uh, Y value. And then for the blue, I've got a large number here for the blue, I've got a large number here for the illumination, and I've got a large number here in my sample. And so that's gonna be a big blue number. And so you can kind of look at the X, Y, and Z as RGB. They're very similar. Okay. And then this is how you do it in Excel. You have these different sum products of those arrays of numbers. Okay. So let's do a top hat on this. Let's see. Okay, so which one of these is the most reasonable guess for the X, Y, Z of the experimental spectrum of the permanganate solution? So there's our image that we just had in the previous one. And then you have the different choices for X, Y, and Z. Which one of those is the most reasonable guess? And again, I'm picking on this because this was in the home. It's in the homework, uh, and many people get to those problems, and they're like, eh. they're trying to do them mathematically, which is great. You can do them mathematically, but they're missing the intuition. They should be able to look at them and say, oh, it's got to be this one because those others don't make sense. And so, if you have some intuition associated with with this, then it'll help you check your answers. Also, the X, Y, and Z values have a minimum of zero and a maximum of one, although sometimes they go a little bit over one by a few percent, but, but that's the natural range of zero to one for these. Okay. Let's see what the spread and the answers are. Okay, very good. D is the correct answer. So we have X, Y, Z in order, so that's red, green, and blue. So we have a large number for the red, zero for the green, and a large number for the blue. Now, in order to get to the computer side of things, this International Color Consortium of Software Companies by Adobe, Apple, and others, um, came up with worldwide standards for color management. Now this is important for forensics because uh, monitors, projectors, cameras, um, all have color profiles. And so it's, I don't think it's still completely standardized, but this is the best effort so far to standardize those things, this International Color Consortium. And on some monitors I've noticed uh, in the past, they'll have ICC profiles. And so you can load an International Color Consortium profile that is a, a way for the company that produced that monitor to best reproduce the RGB values that are on the hard disk. So what they've done is they said, okay, these are the standard RGB values that you should display. They actually display them and then they get the standard observers to look at color cards and they say, okay, you should be, you should be displaying this particular um, RGB value of 186, 0, 165, and it should match this, and you look at the monitor and it does or doesn't match. Okay, you've got, say, the Pantone chip or the, the color card chip that you're trying to match, and so then you would adjust the signals in the monitor driver so that it matches, actually. Now, that would be important if you're trying to display evidence to someone, and I came across this, too, when I was in uh, Pantex and we were looking at the aging of explosives. We produced a poster and the pictures that I received from the person who took pictures of the degraded explosives um, were all various um, shades of pink. Like it looked to me like this explosive, when it aged, turned pink. And and so I was had all these pictures on the poster. They came and looked at the poster and they said, oh, that's not right. I said, what's wrong with it? And they said, no, the explosive turned brown. But the photographs that they took Definitely, instead of brown, it had a little too much red in it. And so all of those pictures came across as pink. Well, that's a big problem 
You know, if I'm looking at this explosive degradation and I see a brown sample and I have, uh, you know, a copy of this person's poster at this explosives conference and it's showing degradation looks pink, then I may have, may think I have a different mechanism of degradation because it looks like a different color. And that was just because the photographs were not accurately reproduced either on my color printer for the poster or on the screen. So. And so they define this device independent standard for RGB color spaces. And so this is the actual standardized three by three matrix. So if you use a spectrometer to come up with the XYZ values, then you can transform them, transform them into RGB values. And then you would do a, a visual comparison for every device. So if we were to make a, a, a color profile for that, spec, for that projector, we would project standard colors up here and then we would set our, our physical standard by it and we would adjust the driver for that projector until the physical object looked like the projected object. And so we could make those adjustments. You may have to do that also in the future in forensic photography. And so we'll talk about that later on. Uh, another way to display color is using the tristimulus values. And so this is a way to convert those, chrom those uh, tristimulus values into chromaticity coordinates. Uh, you just take the x divided by the sum of all three. And so that's little x. So it's case sensitive. Mm -hmm. And then the y value divided by the sum of all three gives us the little y. And this, we have a couple of homework problems on this one too. Now z is not used. You could calculate lowercase z, but it's not used. And it gives us this. So notice down here, this is the, the x coordinate little x coordinate and the y coordinate. And then somewhere in the middle would be for the particular illumination would be called the white point. And there will be a um, kind of a, a curve like this for the standard illuminance and it'll have like 3000 Kelvin maybe 5,000 Kelvin. And then when it gets kind of towards the blue, you might have that 6,500. So the white point will shift based upon your illumination. If you're using a illuminant A, which is a tungsten filament, it's going to be more yellow. And if you're using a D65, it's going to be a little more towards the blue. Uh, this is a nice chromaticity diagram because it has the wavelengths of light all the way around it. So it starts over here at 400. I don't know if you can see that, but that's 400 nanometers. Goes up here, here's 500. This is uh, 520. This is 530. And at 532 is an important number. And that's a neodymium yttrium aluminum garnet crystal laser. So a neodymium laser is at 532. It's just a really inexpensive laser that you can buy. Um, it's a green laser. It's a good alternate light source. But I mean, I have that color ingrained in my head. So I know that that deep green for that laser is 532. A lot of times the green laser pointers or those neodymium lasers, the diode lasers. And so you can um, you can know sort of in the spectrum that's that's a, a good green color. Then you get up here to uh, 4, 545, 50, 560. Yeah, so here's 600. Notice how 600 and 700, there's not a lot of color difference. But you've got to be, um, you know, once you're past 600, you're in the red region. You have uh, just a real sharp peak at between 580 and 590. That's where the orange. So if you really needed to say what color is this particular, um, you know, what wavelength is this particular color, you can use this diagram and you can come in and look at it. Uh, so this is how you calculate these. This is from the PCHEM lab. I'm just going to walk through it again just to re refresh your memory. So, you know, the spectrometer, man, it gives us an enormous amount of data. 
It starts down at 179 nanometers. That's deep into the UV. We're not going to use that for visible color. Okay. So the first thing you do is you just select every five nanometers because the persons that did this analysis only did it at every five nanometers. So they turned a monochromator to 400 and then 405 and then 410 and they adjusted the knobs. Because think about what you're asking that person to do is adjust the knobs for every new wavelength. Well, they only did it at five nanometer increments. Okay. So, um, and then we, so here we have now our visible spectrum. And then we can use the, um, we can use the overlap of that spectrum with the color matching functions. So here's your X values. Y values, Z values, and then the D65 aluminum. And then we can uh, produce those X, Y, Z values. Those, that also, those uh, sum products will give us the X, Y, and Z values. Then we can use this matrix multiplication to generate the standard RGB values. And so this produces this, uh, this spreadsheet that we made in PCHEM1. We have the X, Y, Z values. Then we transform these three with the color uh, the ICC color transform and give us these standard RGB values. Okay. <clears throat> Notice these do range from you know close to zero to maybe a little bit greater than one, but there's still, you know, like I said, the full range is, is zero to one. Same thing for the standard RGB values. Sometimes they go negative, but by a little bit. Sometimes they go a little bit above one, but again, the range is roughly zero to one. But the computer range, the eight-bit values go from zero to 255. And so you can see if it's, uh, if it's greater than one, like this one, it's capped at 255, okay? If it's less than zero, it's capped at zero, okay? And so then now the full range is in the eight bits, uh, zero to 255. And those are the RGB values that we can type in to uh, Excel to or any kind of software to display the colors. Okay. And so assigning those 8-bit values, um, we just, again, you can use the if-then statements to cap those. If it's less than zero, make it zero. Otherwise, if it's greater than one, make it 255. Otherwise, just multiply that value by 255. So it's just a slope of 255. Um, the gamma correction is really for CRT monitors. So we don't really, I mean, I have, can't tell you the last time I saw a CRT monitor. Anybody even know what that is anymore? Do you know? The really deep, gigantic, bulky, thick monitors, which actually is using a cathode ray tube. That's what CRT stands for. You got a hot wire at a high voltage, and it's shooting electrons at the screen and scanning it along. Well, the response of the, that electron gun is not linear. So even though you may uh, double the, the R value from, say, 100 to 200, it doesn't give you twice the brightness. And so you have to correct for this cathode ray, and that's what gamma correction is. And then if you want to display the 8-bit values, pick any object, any drawing object. You can do this in Excel or PowerPoint or Word, and you can make your little square and then go in and adjust the fill color. And right there, RGB values, you can type them in. Now, some of these have other models in there, LUT and so on. So there's other color spaces that you can use. If you want to analyze the, the software or correct your photographs, uh, this is a really good program to use called ImageJ. Uh, it's free because it was uh, um, funded. The development of this program was funded for microscopy, so it was funded by the National Institutes of Health. And because it was government funded, then it's free for us to use. The nice thing about it is it's a, a not just a, a software that you can download, but it's a more like a platform where people can develop plugins for it. So there's a lot of plugins for just dozens of different types of analyses. Edge detection for particle identification or cell identification. Um, contact angle measurements. So we used it for contact angle measurements. Um, you can do animated GIFs in this. It's not very convenient. I'd rather use an online widget, but um, you can do all kinds of things in ImageJ. And so if you take, the nice thing about it is if, if you're just looking at a regular software image program, a lot of times it will tell you the RGB values if you click on a point. 
but you don't want a single pixel RGB value. You want a region. And so in the image J, it allows you to select a region. So you can select this whole region here and go up to analyze tools, color histogram, and it gives you the histogram of the R, the G and the B of every pixel in there. So that is fantastic. And it can give you the, um, the, uh, the mean, it can give you the mode, again, the, the maximum one. And so this is giving us the RGB results, uh, 169.030. So RGB, so run 69, huge red number, zero green, and a little bit of blue, 30 uh, of the 255 bits of blue. So that's the average RGB value for this um, red square. And you could do that with the purple, you could do that with the blue, etc. And so from image analysis, we came in at 0, 20, 85 for the blue one, and our, our standard analysis was 0, 16, 72. So pretty good. You're, you're not going to hit it exactly, and not only that, you can't perceive it exactly. Every one of these um, uh, colors, your eye, you can only perceive, um, what do I want to say? It has to be pretty different before you can perceive a difference. Do you know what I'm saying? Let's go back to this uh, chromaticity diagram. You can find analyses of these for different viewers that say uncertainty ellipsoid. So um, let me draw on here, like that red, anything inside that ellipsoid would appear to me to be the same color. Whereas over here, this ellipsoid will be really small. And so that's telling me I, could pre I can perceive a smaller difference in the green part of the spectrum than I can in the red and in the blue, okay? So these uncertainty ellipsoids, you'll see an analysis of that online as well. And so what that tells me too is that if I have a difference in the RGB values of 72 versus 85, I probably can't tell the difference, right? So it's not like I could tell the difference between 72 and 73. I might not even be able to tell the difference between 72 and 85. Okay, but on the green value, I've got a, I've got um, more sensitivity, so I might be able to tell the difference between a, a green value that was different by say ten, whereas in the blue I might not be able to. And so here's our results. These were the the red, the green, the blue, and the purple. This was from the standard analysis E308 with the International Color Consortium. I took it, pictures at different um, uh, brightness levels. This came in at 169.030. This was 0.440. And up here it came in at 0, 0.127. Uh, 27, so pretty different. And this is, again, a lot brighter than this one. Uh, blue was 0, 0.186.216. And this was 0, 0.165.219. And the purple, 195.0166. And this came in at 114.0105. So, the one thing that we could have done and that might be needed for forensic analysis is if you have a color card and you put it in here with the photograph that you take, you could adjust the image um, on the computer until that color card gives you the exact RGB values that you uh, know that those values are, are set at. And then it would allow you to adjust the brightness and, and the contrast. And then if you adjust your image in any way, you must document what you adjusted and how much adjustment was performed. So, yeah, here's the here's the uncertainty ellipses. Yeah. So it looks like I had it backwards, though. It looks like the green is very big uncertainty and the red is a small uncertainty and the blue is really small. So maybe I had that backwards. Here's that white point uh, curve with the D65 aluminum the A and B illuminates, et cetera. Here are some other color spaces. So this is the uh, LAB color space where you have lightness. So it goes from black to white along L, okay? And then you have A and B. So you have a plus or minus scale for A and you have a plus or minus scale for B. And so these are, are little slices of the A and B region um, at different lightness values. So you see this is uh, a lightness value of 25 
This is a lightness value of 50, and this is a lightness value of 75. And so chroma is how strong the color is, how far away it is from gray. Notice the middle of all of these is kind of a gray region. And this is just, you know, like 25% gray, no color. And then we've got a really bright, like a bright orange here. Then it's like a darker red and a really dark red. Here's the Munsell color catalog system. It's less numerical. So you have all of these different around the outside, these different color codes. And so this would be called a P or RP or R or YR. And so that's the thing I don't like about it is it's not numerical. So we're getting back into um, learned perceptions. This is PB. And then there'll be a couple of numbers. There'll be this uh, 0 to 12 going out towards that color and then the, the dark and bright uh, black to white. So you can kind of see that in this, this series of volumes. You see down here at the bottom we have a, a dark color up to a, a lighter color with the same chroma. What we really, I think, need to do is, is to get away from these evidence cards. And I guess if you're just looking at physical evidence, that may be fine um, to document the photographs and, and the objects of evidence. But I, I like this much better. And I realize it's not in your notes, but just the idea of using uh, a color card like this that has standard pigments. So cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, CMYK. Those are your standard printing pigments. There's going to be something that's repeatable. You can determine the, um, the RGB values for those. If you put this by evidence where color is important, maybe not everything, maybe it's a cigarette butt, okay, that you don't care about, but, but the cigarette butt has lipstick on it, you better put one of these cards next to it so that you can then see what kind of shade that, that uh, lipstick is. And then we have this, again, color mixing. If it's additive color, something like this projector, then it's projecting red, the green, the blue. You add all three of those wavelengths together or those colors together and you get white. On a printed page, it's subtracting color. So these are reflecting yellow, reflecting M for magenta and C for cyan. And if you're not reflecting anything, it's black. But notice how that's not quite black. It's just not. Okay, this is black. And so you see the difference? And so it just doesn't get enough black by just subtracting or trying to subtract all of these. And so that's why they add in that fourth pigment. They have a true carbon black as a fourth pigment to really get the dark um, black contrast with the other colors. Now, we talked about... Um, these kinds of uh, subtractive colors and uh, and colors uh, reflected or transmitted um, and and we have these ideas or we've talked about the different um, molecules that make up dyes and pigments but here we're going to emphasize again that dyes are soluble so really not anything related to the molecule that we're talking about um, dyes and pigments can be inorganic or organic substances um, but it's really how they're delivered, the carrier solvent. If it's dissolved in the carrier solvent, then it's a dye. If it's a suspended particle and not soluble in the carrier solvent, then it's a pigment. Um, we could also classify these things based on their structure. They could be acids, they could be salts, uh, anions, cations, etc. We talked about the azo compounds and, and triaromethines, etc. We could classify them with their chem abstract number. But there's also a color index number maintained by these different organizations. And so like red pigment 48 will have this color index number. Now it would be hard to tell what the RGB values for red pigment 48 are. What do you think you would need? So this is a good question. What would you need to give me the RGB values for that?
So I give it to you in the lab. It's a bottle. You open it up. It looks black. Okay. So RGB values of just the powder might be zero, zero, zero. But what is? It's like pure. Okay. So what would you do? How would you do an experiment to get the RGB values? We just kind of went through the whole process for permanganate. Certain amount, how much, right? So you've got a, you're going to get different results based upon the concentration. I mean, it'll be the, generally the same color, but it'd be really light if it's a weak concentration. It'd be really strong if it's a dark, con or, you know, a strong concentration would be really dark. And so it'd be really hard to say this pigment produces this RGB value. It might produce a range. Okay. And so you may want to, like, if you were trying to classify these different things, you may say, you know, the Munsell color system would say an R or an RP, and it'd be in the range of values 0 to 12 or something like that. You could do a similar thing with the RGB values. You could give the range from, you know, maybe a 1% concentration to 10 parts per million, and you could give the range for the RGB values. <clears throat> now, in terms of inks, Again, for, for pen inks, they're going to be a solvent. It's going to be some sort of vehicle for delivering it to the substance. Uh, those have to be somewhat volatile. Uh, Water is not very volatile, but in a thin layer, in a hot object, in a room temperature object, it's going to evaporate fairly quickly. But, but I like um, oil-based <laughs> inks better because they, they dry faster. They don't wet the paper and so on. Uh, you can get um, MEK or ethers or isulfurone, this, this molecule up here, <clears throat> as a solvent vehicle. <clears throat> you could also put in additives. So we did a lot with the cleaning uh, chemistry, trying to find a good soil to test. And so we, we were using Sharpie on frosted glass. And it's actually a really difficult thing to remove, naturally, because they want it to stay put. It's an ink. Okay, what makes it hard to remove? Well, You've got the pen, the Sharpie pen, you know, felt tip, and it writes on the surface, okay, so you've got this mark, and the, uh, it's got carbon in it. So really fine particles of carbon. It's got some other, other um, dyes and pigments. But it also has a polymer binder. And then the solvent evaporates. So then the solvent evaporates. So it leaves behind that polymer binder on top of the carbon black and the different pigments, and that makes it stay put. Okay. So you may not be able to find out what solvent was used, but you would be able to tell maybe a profile of the dyes and pigments and might be able to get uh, some evidence of the polymer binder if you had enough of the ink. You can wash this off. It's difficult, but you can do it. And uh, we've had locally, this is kind of interesting. My wife's an accountant, and so she hears stories, of, you know, from other accountants and businesses and so on. And people are are doing what they call washing checks. Okay, so think about the printing process versus the writing process. The printing process, a lot of times, is is pressed. Uh, you know, mechanical pressing. Uh, so when they're making these checks, they're running them through this uh, plate process that prints the bank's uh, address and everything like that, those inks for some particular checks are more strongly adhered to the paper than the signature or the two line. And so they can take, uh, they can take that check and they can wash with a solvent who that check is made out to and wash that off. And then they can write themselves into it. So this is an official check from this company with the official signature and it's made out to you. <laughs> and you go deposit it and 
everything looks good. It goes through the bank system. The company's checking their check registry. They're like, okay, that check cleared, that check cleared, that check cleared. If they don't look at the images and say, hey, I wrote that check to company or person A and whoever this person is checked it. So they're stealing it out of the mail, washing off the two line and putting their name in. So pretty, pretty interesting. So other ways of, of printing again is, is um, uh, typewriters, of course. When we toured the FBI facility in DC, they had, they showed us the typewriter room for like ransom notes and everything. And they used to buy like every model of typewriter that, that companies would make. Um, but now with printers and everything, there's just so many different ways to, to make, make a ransom note, if you will. Um, and, and electronic communication that I, I don't know that they still do the typewriter thing. Um, and then laser printers and copiers. So this drum inside the, the copy machine is uh, can pick up charges based upon light. So they shine light on the document and it charges or sticks that image on the drum in, in charged areas. And then the toner is attracted to those charged areas. And so the toner sticks to wherever the, the writing is and then the paper runs across and, and uh, this is actually Locard's principle in forensic science that whenever two objects meet, there's an exchange. And so the drum and the paper meet and the toner is transferred to the paper. Now it'll come off and if you've ever had a paper jam and you pull it out where you've got the image on there but the toner's loose, it hasn't been fused. And so that toner has a small waxy property to it that when it runs through the fuser, it sticks to the paper. And so there's a hot wire the paper goes through and it fuses that that image to the paper by kind of melting. It doesn't quite melt, but it, it softens the, the toner and then it sticks to the paper. So the, the secret to adhesion is entanglement and the paper is really rough and the toner, these little spherical properties and parts of particles of toner are not very rough, but you run them through this fuser and they soften and they stick to that rough paper. And that's how um, how it sticks. You can also do papers that um, change color with heat. And so you have these little wires that heat up and will will print. A lot of your receipt printers are thermal printers. That writing will fade over time, too. So I don't know if you've ever kept a receipt in your pocket, like, you know, guys with their uh, wallets or whatever. I'll pull a receipt out of my wallet after I've been sitting on it for months and months and months and the writing's gone because <laughs> I've heated it back up and, and lost the signal. Then we get into paints, and like I was talking about the Sharpie, the paint is very similar. It's got a pigment that's suspended in the polymer matrix. The solvent evaporates, the polymer dries, and sometimes with oxygen, that polymer will cross-link and make an insoluble um, paint or coating. And so here's this, we put the paint down, the solvent evaporates, the binder polymerizes, and then it makes a protective adhesive film. Automotive paint is way more complex. So this might be like a house paint. You've got the, the base particles and colors, the titanium oxide, which is the white color, and then all the different other colored molecules to get the color that you want. And then that polymer film is coating it and it you know, provides a, a, you know, a hard coating that's cleanable, washable. For automotive paint, you have all kinds of uh, coats. So you might have the metal and then a primer and then a second primer on top of that and then this color layer and they may have again that may go down into like like this may be shrunk down to here and then you have a clear coat on top and the clear coat could have a color and so you might have metal flakes in there you might have a clear coat you might have a couple of primers so there's lots of different layers that you can analyze to analyze paint. It's a really complex process and it has led to errors in analysis. So if someone comes along and gets just an infrared spectrum of the clear coat, this is a famous mistake where they get an infrared spectrum of the clear coat and compare it to the evidence. Um, and they say, yeah, these paints match, but they just got the infrared spectrum of the clear coat and they could be completely different colors because the color layer may be down here in this metal flake layer. Uh, it's better to get a, a microtome or a 
um, cross section. Now these layers are really small. For our ATR in the lab, that's a one millimeter spot size. And these layers are only microns thick. So they might be, you know, one tenth of our spot size. So how are we gonna get a good spectrum when the thickness of your layer that you're trying to get a spectrum of is one tenth of your spot size? You grind the, the paint off at an angle. And so you see that this is spread out and then you analyze this, now your spot size is this big or your, your paint layer is this big and your paint layer. See, so you if you grind it off at an angle and buff it, then you can come in and you can analyze those different layers. Now that's, you know, you're destroying the paint. Like if you've got a vehicle that's a suspect vehicle, uh, you're going to have to analyze a spot and you have to, you know, grind off a, a circle of the paint, uh, really, you know, buff it off until you get down to the base metal. Um, but it'll leave a blemish. And so that's it.